Good morning. Um, as Brooks said, I'm Will Allen. Uh, Danny Griffith here is my partner in crime. Uh, my firm is out of Brookhaven. Um, we're a six-man defense firm um, that's been there since 1938. My grandfather started our firm. He uh, started doing uh, governmental work at that time. He represented the Board of Supervisors for about 35 years. My dad is our senior partner. He represents uh, Lincoln County and has had that uh, uh, position for 39 years this year. Um, I've been back in Mississippi for about 16 years, and uh, this is what I do every day. Um, Danny's in the same boat, family firm. Um, he's actually just struck out on his own here recently, but uh, we both do this work every day. I, I, I tell you that so you'll understand not because we're it's you know bragging, but because this is what we do. We don't do divorce work or estate work. Day in and day out, what we're doing is taking care of counties, um, sheriff's departments, officers, um, sheriffs themselves, things of that nature. I represent the Mississippi Sheriff's Association. Um, we do this work every day, so it's our bread and butter. Um, what we want to do today, this morning, is talk about some employment practices, just so we'll understand. Uh, the types of folks we've got here today. It looks like a, a diverse group. Obviously, I see some, some sheriff's department officials, it looks like. Um, we have, uh, I know, at least one board attorney. Any other attorneys here? That's good. More than three lawyers would be a handful. Um, county administration officials. Okay. All right. Um, this seminar works best when we talk to one another. Um, we're gonna give you a primer on some basic employment law issues, uh, but what you've got today is two lawyers who are free. So if you've got that question that you've been wanting to ask, but didn't wanna bother the board attorney or thought you'd have to pay somebody, today's the day. Um, we may not know the answer, and if we don't, we're not gonna lie to you too much. Uh, we'll tell you we need to go look it up. But what we like to do is we're gonna, we're gonna fly through the slides that we've got just so we'll, we'll make it on time. But at any time, if you, if you wanna stop us, you don't have to wait till the end. Stop us right then, raise your hand, and uh, we'll talk about some situations. Um, that's the easiest way we found to really flesh out these issues. You may be dealing, something, dealing with something that somebody else in the room is dealing with. And it'd be great for us to be able to discuss those things. Um, Danny and I, we have the privilege of not having to run for office, and we don't have to be nice and get elected or, or act nice for a, an elected boss, right? We don't care what the public thinks. So that means that we're not exactly practical some of the time. One of the best reasons for you to ask questions and for us to talk is um, we can talk through these things and you can lend uh, some information uh, uh, that's more practical. Some things, we're, we're gonna tell you the best way to limit your liability. But as I tell my sheriffs every uh, conference, you know, that may not be possible. It may not be mechanically possible, it may not be politically possible for you to do this. Well, if that's the case, and you speak up today, we can move to this next, next grade. That would be pretty good, not the best way, but under the circumstances, the only way something will work. Does that make sense? So what we need to do is we need to have a conversation. We are not preachers. It is obvious that we are not preachers. If you spend a little time with us, you'll know it. Uh, so you don't want us standing up here preaching to you. Um, we're gonna talk, but we need you to participate. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna flip through these slides and uh, we'll get going fast because we've got a lot of slides. This is not as long as some of our other presentations. We're gonna take a break just about every hour uh, because nobody ought to have to listen to a, a lawyer for more than one hour at a time. Um, Danny, you wanna kick us uh, off? I'm Danny Griffith. Uh, practiced law for 27 years now. Uh, all of that has been dealing with school districts, cities, counties, sheriff's departments, police departments. What we do when we're looking at employment litigation 90% of the time is to first put it in context of the type of entity that we're dealing with. Uh, if I'm dealing with the sheriff's department, I'm gonna first take into account the structure of the sheriff's department with the sheriff as the policy making official. 
how that particular department is set up. Uh, if I am dealing with a personnel claim that comes out of, uh, say, a road department, same thing. I'm going to look at how they are structured. Uh, there are common structures to all of our county governments, uh, but that structure, keep in mind, is how the federal laws that mostly control employment cases interact and work. It's not static because it depends on your individual entity, on the individual facts and circumstances of the case, and what your history is. Uh, that, that, that's the nature of personnel administration in county government. Uh, so what we're going to cover overview-wise with you here today, and, and, and like Will says, the biggest help that you can have, or the biggest help that we can have is, for instance, asking a question, put that in context of my sheriff's department, or put that in context of our justice court, or put that in context of our E911 department. Uh, we may or may not have time to cover all of that, but unless you raise a hand or make a noise, we're going to keep flowing. Uh, the basic areas that we're going to cover uh, is at-will employment in Mississippi, as you know. We have at-will employment, and uh, there are individuals that would tell you that at-will employment is dead. It is not but it is at-will employment that you have to consider in the context of substantive state law and federal law. Uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act uh, will affect most employment claims that we're going to deal with with public entities, but not all. Uh, you have the Americans with Disability Act, you have the Age Discrimination Act, you have uh, Family Medical Leave Act, and then of course you have the Fair Labor Standards Act. We're not going to be able to cover all of those in a huge detail. This is an overview. Uh, but like I said, the overview is important and will be more functional if we can put it in, in, in some county context. Now in Mississippi, uh, with a county government, as you know, you're going to run into two basic forms of county government. And if I am say I'm coming to Octavia Hall County, the first thing I'm going to look and see is are you a unit system or are you a beat system? Now in some cases it doesn't make any difference with the employment claim and in some cases it makes a great deal of difference. Uh, those are just specific questions that we're going to need to know. Most majority of counties now in Mississippi are unit system counties but by no means are they all unit system counties. Uh, but the big difference is with a unit system, we're mostly going to be dealing with a board attorney or the county administrator. And with an individual beat system, we're probably going to deal with the individual supervisor and probably still deal with the board attorney. Uh, the board attorney is absolutely indispensable to dealing with personnel litigation or employment practices litigation with the county government. Uh, I just, I almost insist that the board attorney be involved and be in the loop. Uh, if you can think of it this way, uh, it's like having the home field. Uh, it's uh, access and information. Uh, we can certainly uh, we can certainly do our best without that type of input. But if we can put together a team effort and we can have the appropriate county officials involved and informed, we can do you we can do you a much better job. Um, now, one of the things that I'm going to ask if I come in, let's say I, we're sitting in Starville, so, so one of the things that I'm going to want to look at first off is what does your personnel policy manual have in it? I'm going to go through it. Uh, I'm going to go through and look at the particular job descriptions. Why? Because it's going to impact what that employee is supposed to do and not supposed to do, how that employee is to be treated. Uh, so that's going to be one of the first things I'm going to ask you about. Uh, now, the things that I'm going to be looking for, and, and slow me down if you need me to, uh, is I'm going to look in there and I'm going to see what the terms and conditions of the particular position at issue it is. Now, we will have. Uh, Potential claims arise from 
anywhere within county government. Uh, so knowing how that employee fits within the particular structure is just absolutely critical to us. Uh, we're going to look and see how the particular entity, in this case a county usually, or sometimes a sheriff's department, uh, is, uh, is informing their employees of what their rights and responsibilities are. Uh, because if an employee does not know what they're supposed to do, it's very difficult to hold them accountable. Um, the employment manual is going to help put some solid detail to that relationship between employer and employee. Realize we're, we're still doing this in the context of a governmental entity. Uh, there are things at a local level as an employer that are controlled locally. Not everything, but uh, those things, again, they should be reflected in that employment manual. Uh, the biggest uh, areas there that we're going to look for in the employment manual on the state law side, when Will gets to uh, talking about at-will employment, uh, is, to, is to see if any rights have been created beyond what state law provides. Uh, so just to check off, if I were going to go through and I were going to look at the Octavia Hall County uh, personnel policy. I'm going to look and see what the terms and conditions are for the particular employment position that's at issue. Uh, I'm going to look and make sure that it has an anti-discrimination statement, that there's a solid sexual harassment policy. That the, uh, in a given case, uh, we have cases that involve leave policies, and you'll see grievance policies here on the list. The reason why you want to look at a grievance policy is because we have state law claims that are also an avenue for employment claims and if you have an appropriate grievance policy in your personnel policy and it was not exercised, that's a defense to the employer. Uh, we're, I have claims pending right now where the relevant drug and alcohol policy of the entity is an issue and you know, the individual is claiming that they were treated unfairly and uh, you, as part of your response to the EEOC, we're going to produce the drug and alcohol policy and then we're going to produce where they acknowledged and received the policy and then we're going to produce whatever the disputed conduct was. Uh, if you have all that documented, life's easier. If you're not documented, you're going to have problems. It's just, it <coughs> sounds like an oversimplification, but that's the truth. Um, we're going to look and see, because the EEOC in many cases is going to be involved and they're going to be asking, they're going to want to know what appeal process do you have within your governmental entity where an employee can raise disputes and, and reach some level of relief without having to go outside the entity. Um, in your personnel policies, when I'm going through job descriptions, uh, Again, what we'll be looking for, and we have it listed here, we're going to be looking to see how the particular position is defined, what they're supposed to do, what are their essential functions. Uh, because if you're disciplining somebody and the employer has not defined uh, the particular item as an essential function, the employer's going to have a problem. Uh, now, one of the things that we have to look at by department, uh, in particular sheriff's departments with county governments, uh, the role, and, and, and it's too big of a role to totally cover here today, but there is a distinct difference when you have an elected countywide official over a department versus an appointed countywide official over a department. Uh, there's far less control with the Board of Supervisors of a sheriff. Uh, it is a political relationship that uh, in many cases functions very smoothly and others it does not. And that role, when I, when I, when I come in and, and I come into your county, I, I've got to have somebody locally explain how that relationship is working because I haven't been sitting at all your board meetings. Uh, and I, I've, I've sat through, many, through so many hundreds of school board meetings and city meetings and counties over the years. Uh, one of the things that dawns on me is the person that's been sitting there really needs to give me some scoop as to 
who gets along and how they were inter how they are interacting because there's a great deal of flexibility there. Um, the different types of positions that we look at there with counties are listed. Uh, Sheriff's Department, Chantry Clerk, some elected, some appointed. In this situation, we're listing all elected countywide officials. And just because federal law has a big overview or a big requirement, we've got to look at how those state officials function and, and that's going to impact the interpretation of federal law. Now, one of the things, let's say if I'm going through and the issue is hiring. Uh, we, we've got some do's and don'ts here, and it's by no means exhaustive. Uh, a lot of these are common sense, uh, but realize they reflect upon different federal statutory provisions. Are you married? Uh, how, many, I, you know, how many children do you have? Are you a U.S. citizen? Uh, where were you born? Uh, and all of these ref reflect on age, sex, religion, disability. Uh, so this is by no means exhaustive, but when you do interviews or whoever the entity is for your particular department that does interviews, advanced preparation and having a good understanding of the do's and don'ts uh, is helpful. I, I have sat in board meetings where I had board members kind of winging it and it is I just end up shaking my head at some of the questions I hear asked um, so that advanced preparation will make life easier her question was about there are some federal reporting requirements regarding immigration status and that is true we have to do what the law requires I'm just curious before we start next how many of you uh, have uh, policy manuals that have personnel policies and written job descriptions. It, it reminds me, you know, we go through cycles on these things uh, where, you know, there was a time you didn't want anything written policy-wise. There's a lawyer in, an older lawyer who's passed away in Brookhaven, and he did a lot of divorce work, and one of his sayings was always, say it in roses or say it in mink, but for God's sakes, don't say it in ink. And for many years, that was kind of the, the way we did it in, in county government. We didn't want to put down exactly what the policy was because it tied us down. Uh, those days are gone. Now, the more you can have uh, written out uh, explaining what you're going to do, uh, the better off you're going to be. Um, one of the things that occurred to me is Danny was emphasizing <clears throat> the uh, board attorneys. Um, you're going to hear a lot of information today, and the last thing that Danny Griffith and I want to happen is for you to go make a change without consulting your board attorney. You have a board attorney for a reason, um, and they know the politics, as he was mentioning, that we don't know. And they are your go-to. I am absolutely 100% happy for you to take a slide to them and say, hey, look, we think this is a good way to do it. We'd like to change this. But don't change it and then have the board attorney call me and say, well, Alan, you don't represent my board. What are you doing? Okay? So these guys are a, and gals are a huge resource. Go through them because there's some things that they'll know about the lay of the land that we don't, all right? Don't get us in trouble. We're going to move on and talk about um, at-will employment. Um, in Mississippi, when there isn't a written employment agreement, that employee is considered an at-will employee. Who, who has heard that term and tossed around or, or knows maybe what that means? Anybody? Don't be shy. I see you back there. Um, Mississippi's been an at-will employment state for or, over 150 years, and essentially that means that if there isn't a written employment agreement, then that person can be fired for any reason, no reason, bad reason. Uh, it doesn't matter. They can be fired for anything with some limitations. You know, lawyers were always coming back with that, that caveat. 
Um, I try to explain this to folks a lot when I'm talking about it is, you know, if I hire a legal assistant and she comes in and has purple hair and I don't like purple hair, I like red and green hair, I can fire that person for having purple hair. Uh, if she wears cologne, uh, some perfume that I don't appreciate, I can fire that person. They work at the will and pleasure of their employer. Make sense? There are limitations under both federal and state law. What you need to understand most significantly is under federal law, the at-will employment um, doctrine does not allow you to ignore federal law. So you still can't fire somebody because of their sex. You still can't fire somebody because of their race, right? The, the, the federal limitations still apply. Um, the state law limitations are the ones that are really tossed out. Um, you couldn't fire somebody just because you think they're too old. So you have to keep that in mind. Now, under state law, this doctrine has always been very, very strong. You have to understand, too, that a lot of people don't like the at-will employment doctrine because it is very much employer friendly. Um, Employees would rather you have to have cause to fire them, right? You know, it shouldn't be at your whim and pleasure. Well, Mississippi is stuck with that doctrine for 150 years. We've always just, gro just grooved right by this topic. Unfortunately, uh, that has changed in the past three months. Um, the, the only limitation we had prior to three or four months ago was what we call the public policy exception or the McCarn exception. Um, McCarn versus Allied Bruce Terminix is a lawsuit that a former termite sprayer brought after he got fired. And the long and the short of it was this guy realized that his employer was not actually spraying the chemicals that they were being paid to spray. Guy decided, the employers apparently decided, hey, you know, these chemicals are expensive. People don't are not out there, especially on new construction, when they're spraying uh, the, the concrete uh, pad, people aren't out there to watch it go down. We can save some money here by not actually doing the job. Um, when this employee figures it out, Mr. McCarn, he goes and reports them to the Agriculture Commission. Um, as soon as they find out that he has actually reported them, they can him, right? Under the at will employment doctrine, they can fire him. Any reason, no reason, good reason, bad reason, right? The Supreme Court decided, okay, we're only gonna let this go so far, and so they, they came up with two exceptions. You can't fire somebody for refusing to participate in illegal activity. So if uh, they came to Mr. McCarn and said, we want you to put water in your sprayer, and go out there and spray it, and we're gonna charge him for the chemical spray, and he doesn't wanna do it, says, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Y you can't fire him for that. Make sense? I mean, that's just obvious. We can't require people to engage in criminal activity. Um, this isn't as strong as it sounds because it literally can't be a regulation. Uh, it, can't, it, it has to be something that is a specific crime. Um, they also said that you can't fire them for reporting illegal activities. It's a whistleblower statute primarily, this, or this exemption is a whistleblower exemption. You know, this is exactly what McCarn did. He goes in and explains, hey look, these guys are ripping off the public by spraying water, not the chemicals. You know, I, you, you don't want to uh, be able to fire somebody for that. Obviously, this employer did, but as a public, we don't want folks to, to be fired for that. Um, I love the language that they use. Uh, the employer should not be able to thwart the public good by firing employees who speak the truth. Even though I represent employers, not employees, that just makes good common sense, doesn't it? That just makes sense. Now, as I said, this was a super strong doctrine. It was so strong that in Mississippi, it is still permissible for, to fire someone who files a workers' comp claim. Now think about that for a second. Workers' comp 
is a system we put in place to benefit both an employer and employee. It benefits the employer because they're not subject to regular tort liability, which is extremely expensive. Regular injury lawsuit, if your employee can sue you because you got your hand crushed in a, a press machine, the liability there would be huge, right? Well, we cut that off by putting in comp. The employee is benefited because he doesn't have to show uh, that the employer was responsible for it. He doesn't have to show proximate cause. All he's got to show is, I was at work, this happened. Even if it was his own fault, he, he recovers, he or she recovers. It's, it's a good system. It's for the public good. In Mississippi, if I have Mr. Griffith working for me and he hurts himself and files a worker's comp claim, as he has a right to do, I can fire him. That's how strong it is, right? It's strong, folks. That's why folks don't like it. Labor people just don't like it. Well, we had a recent case that you may have seen, Swindoll versus Aurora Flight Sciences Corporation. Has anybody seen anything about this case? It was in the news. Um, you'd have to be sort of a law nerd to want to read it, even though it's in the paper. Um, the plaintiff in this case brought a, a firearm to his workplace. Now, he locked it in his truck. When his employer found out, they immediately fired him for bringing a, a gun to his workplace, leaving it in the truck locked. Um, you have to understand, because of all the publicity for open carry, anything to do with the guns right now is a big deal. Well, he filed suit in the United States District Court, granted the employer's motion to dismiss, saying, hey, at will employee, firing for any reason, no reason, good reason, bad reason, right? Just right down the middle, this is nothing unusual, typical at will employee uh, claim. Unfortunately, um, it went up to the Fifth Circuit on appeal, the employer won it, Fifth Circuit says, you know what, we're not exactly sure what Mississippi would say here, so they certified it. And that, what that basically means is they kicked it down to the Mississippi Supreme Court and said, look, this is your law, Mississippi law, that we're applying. We can't look at your prior cases and figure out what you really would do here. We want you to tell us. Certify this question. Tell us the answer what you would do. Um, here's the, the reason that this was so um, controversial. There is a state statute that specifically prohibits employers from taking any action against employees who store guns in locked automobiles. All right? Now, so what you've got is that statute, section 45-9-55, locked up against the at-will employment doctrine. So the Fifth Circuit says, Mississippi Supreme Court, you figure this out, all right? Um, the Fifth, the uh, Supreme Court said, because the legislature specifically barred this conduct, an employer firing somebody for having a gun locked up in their vehicle, we're gonna say it's an exception to McCarn. Y'all, it, it doesn't seem like a big deal. This is a huge deal. Like Danny says, it doesn't mean the at-will employment doctrine is dead, but it, it does mean that for the first time in a in hundred years, we've, we've done something with it. You know, McCarn is an old case, it's not hundred years old, but that's the only decision out there that had any impact on at-will employment for over a hundred years. It is just not a doctrine that has been touched. Um, there are a lot of people who think that this signifies that we're about to start cutting it up. And it may well mean that. Um, I think that if that's the case, we'll know very quickly somebody's going to file that comp claim again. Because even in places where there is an at-will employment doctrine, most places will allow you to sue if you're fired for filing a workers' comp claim. I bet that's the next place that comes under attack. So a summary here of this doctrine, um, employees who are not contractual. I, I mean, do you guys have any contracted employees? I know sheriff's departments don't. So essentially, everybody that works with you is probably an at-will employee. The doctrine still applies that they can be fired for any reason, no reason, bad reason, good reason. But there are these exceptions. You cannot fire them for reporting illegal activity. You cannot fire them for refusing to engage in illegal activity 
and, and out here in left field, you cannot fire them for bringing a, lock, a gun to their workplace that's locked in their car. Um, this is a significant change, and we'll see uh, our Miss, the Mississippi Supreme Court has changed personnel a good bit, and the rulings over the past five to seven years, I guess, Danny, um, have really changed. And it's, it's not as conservative a court as we've had. Um, it'll be interesting to see how far they take this. Any questions on that? Such riveting stuff. If you think of something later, just raise your hand. We're going to move into a quick overview now of Title VII, the Civil Rights Act. I know all of you are somewhat familiar with this. Um, it essentially says uh, that you cannot uh, discriminate in employment uh, because of race, uh, because of sex, um, religion, uh, things of that nature. Um, you can't take adverse employment actions. It doesn't just mean discharge. Um, it can mean um, a demotion. It can uh, mean a uh, hostile environment. So it's, it's much broader than just hiring and firing. But that is the context you'll see it in most. Uh, we routinely uh, defend cases for uh, counties and sheriff's departments where they fire somebody and they've had a good reason to fire them, but that person fits in one of the what we call protected classes and uh, they file suit. And uh, a lot of times, especially, you know, Danny's really good about reminding y'all to uh, paperwork. You know, paperwork. You need a paper trail. Every time something, any employment decision is made, there needs to be a paper trail. We, we defended a case together. I had a couple of clients, he had a couple of clients, and this particular employee was just trouble. I mean, she just got in there and stirred the pot, and she was working uh, as a uh, booking officer. So the booking, uh, this was in South Mississippi, the booking area was uh, a little cage in the middle of the jail so everybody had to come through there and she just started stuff with everybody well that's all well and good but when we got down there and said okay where are the disciplinary forms they started looking this this young lady been working for us for seven years and they pull out four and they're they're testimony to us had been, I mean, every other day she doesn't, she gets a clothing violation. She uses her cell phone in the jail she's not supposed to. Um, you know, she calls someone, uh, uh, a black person, the N-word. I mean, she, the, you know, big stuff here. And we start looking through and there's nothing. There's two uniform violations. And I'm like, okay, where's the rest of it? Well, we didn't write it all down. That. That doesn't help me. That doesn't help Danny. We had to try the case. We couldn't get out on motion because there wasn't documentary evidence. So if you take nothing away from it, take this. Paper trail. We need a paper trail. The biggest thing that I see if I'm looking through personnel records and personnel files on the claim is if you're looking at the file objectively, if you come in, you're looking at John Doe or Jane Doe's file, and you can look and see a giant uptick in the amount of write-ups and paper. Be skeptical. Now, if it's your employee files, avoid that. Uh, because what, what it creates or can create is, is an inference of retaliatory conduct. You know, we've got claims Besides these statutory claims that we deal with that are retaliation based and, and sometimes the standards are not absolute, sometimes it's a mixed motive standard. And if an objective individual can look at July the 10th, 2013 as, as some type of date where the employee did something or didn't do something, let's say we're getting into an area of free speech or somebody has filed a prior charge with the EEOC. And you go start looking at that personnel file and all of a sudden they've gone from performance evaluations that if somebody is going through the motions and checking off all fours and fives and all of a sudden they're getting criticized and all of a sudden they're getting written up. It don't look, it don't look good. 
and then this is a this is a fantastic example. You know, we deal with folks, and uh, they, they've got problem employees. It's obvious to see. You don't have to do anything except meet the employee to know this is this person is a pain. Um, but what happens is we're lazy, and so we don't write them up. You know, we may give them a verbal. But we don't write them up, and so what happens when, for example, this case Danny and I had, the, uh, the employee ended up having a First Amendment claim because she testified uh, about something that she thought went on at the Sheriff's Department. Well, after that, she got write-ups. You know, she, that's the only time she did get write-ups was after that moment. Before that, every performance evaluation was all fives. Um, you know, they had even talked about uh, elevating her to a, to a supervisory position. That happens and bam, all the little uh, disciplinary forms that she did have came out after that. To a jury, that's, that's suspicious, right? You see that? Um, I think the, the key to this is you can't do what Danny said. You can't just go through the motions and check them off. These things are important. You know, if you have annual reviews, they need to be real. You know, get down on it. And you, if you've got a real issue with that person, you need to put it down there. I, I know a lot of folks that I deal with, you know, I don't want to put something in their file. I, I, I like this guy, he, you know, he's overslept a good bit, but he's, you know, he's got a hard uh, life right now. He's a single dad, he's, he's taking care of his kids, so he's coming in late a little bit. You, you, gotta, you gotta be real. You know, if you don't, and something happens at the end of the day, it's gonna be very difficult on you. Um, we kind of look at these cases as can we get out on a motion. Uh, after a little bit of discovery, we like to file a motion for summary judgment, which basically says, hey judge, we've got sworn testimony from the plaintiff, we got sworn testimony from the sheriff, the jail administrator, the county administrator. There are no he said, she said on this one. Look at the facts and you know, we're not saying she's a liar. We're, we're, we're talking about the same instances. We win. Well, when there are no documents to back it up, and she says, well, they always said I was the best employee they had, and then right after she gives some sort of bad testimony, we've got three days in a row where, you know, we get on her from everything for the type of shoelaces she has to the perfume she wears. It doesn't look good. We can't get out on motion. We're going to lose that. We're going to go try that case. It's going to cost the county a bunch of money just to try it. Um, so what you want to do is you want to be vigilant and diligent about your paperwork. So there's my lecture for today on paperwork. Another thing, well, no, it would be the first of about mentioned it about ten times. But another thing that's really, really important, and I'm sorry I'm giving this video guy grief, but uh, if we're dealing with employees who are controlled by action on the minutes of the board of supervisors having clear entries in the minutes make all the difference in the world for a variety of reasons. Give an example of well, that. I'll works. give you a good example. There are defense after defense after defense that we raise on your behalf that work simply because it's documented in the minutes. When Will gets to Title VII, he's gonna go through what Title VII does and, about, and is about, and then I'm gonna go in a little bit more detail about the claims process, but if you have uh, a, the type of claim that requires submission to the EEOC, they're going to look at it and they're going to look at your appeal process and they're going to look at how you're documenting. If you've got in your minutes board action that was subject to appeal, does anybody know what is subject to appeal that a board rules on? Everything. 115175, you've got 10 days to go to the circuit court. If you say it's unconstitutional, if you say it's illegal, if you say it's arbitrary and capricious. Now, if I've got that entry in your board minutes and somebody wants to come in and say, oh no, the real reason they fired me wasn't my race, it was, I mean, it was my race or my gender, it wasn't because I violated this work rule. Now, if what I'm producing to the EEOC says, do not be smoking out in the lobby of the sheriff's department. And I can say that, and I know that's just a random reason, but if there is a reason in your personnel policy that provides for termination, and then there is a termination on your board minutes, 
They cannot come in in the context of either the EEOC investigation or subsequent litigation and challenge the employer's determination. It's final. Uh, so there are mechanisms under state law how we operate that affect how these federal statutes play out. So really clear minutes. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? Because here's what happens. Here's what should happen. You, you uh, have a, a work rule that says no smoking inside. Let's make it more realistic. No smoking right outside the door of the sheriff's department because it sucks all that smoke in, right? You're probably not going to fire them that. Make it no smoking dog. Whatever, so a work rule that results in termination and you put it on your minutes. Yeah. When that happens, you want the board of supervisors to put that determination on the minutes because then uh, the, the claimant, potential claimant, has 10 days. And if they do not appeal it, that is the established violation. It is a work rule violation. That's, that really hurts their Title VII claim. Really hurts it. Let me, let, me, uh, let me move along a little bit here. Title VII includes not just discrimination, which would be firing or hiring for a race or sex, but also, as we said, harassment, hostile environment. We see a lot of these claims. The, the hostile environment claim, uh, we just handled one together uh, where it was a racial claim um, uh, by uh, a Caucasian um, and uh, just the, the harassment she alleged was every day, you know, she was harassed because of her race. Um, you have to be a member of a protected class, which is easy. It, you know, if you're African American, you're, that's your protected class. If you're female, that's your protected class. Um, on the discharge uh, type of thing, you have to show that they were subjected to an adverse employment react, um, action. So for example, if we fire somebody to, to file a Title VII claim, they have to show, okay, I was in the protected class and I was discharged and the basis for my discharge was my race. What Danny was pointing out is if we have a work rule violation that's established by our board minutes, then that, that ain't gonna fly. This will require you at the Sheriff's Department to work closely with your board attorney. I know a lot of my Sheriff's Departments uh, don't ever get anything put on the minutes when they take an employment action, right? You don't go to the board attorney because the Sheriff has the right to hire and fire his folks. Um, but it's a very good prophylactic measure to go to the board. In a lot of cases, if I just had that entry on the minutes. That's right. We think that all the time if we just had the entry. Um, Let's see, let me flip through and get to some. Hey, you're about an hour. Let me go into Title VII. I'll, well, I, I'll, I'm actually going to finish it real quick. Let me see what we need to talk about here. Let's, let me give you a couple of slides here on a uh, hostile environment. Um, the, the, the unfortunate thing about Title VII hostile environment claims is. The, the, the courts kind of view it the way they do pornography. You know, we, most people have heard that they were unable to define pornography, so one of the justices said, I, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, right? That's kind of how the, the Fifth Circuit has been on, on hostile environment. They've not given us this bright line rule that if this happens, if you hear this word 15 times in the course of 10 days, we know you're being uh, uh, harassed. We don't have that. What they do look at, though, is the frequency and the severity, okay? You know, I've had a bunch of cases where people said inappropriate things. You know, I mean, look, uh, Danny and I are concerned today that we'll say something inappropriate on the video, right? I mean, we all go through life and things pop out of our mouth that we wish we could rewind, right? Um, one such statement, you know, unless, even if it is severe, is not gonna be a hostile environment. So when, when this kind of comes up, when somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm, I'm being harassed because I'm a woman, and you should have a policy in writing that says we do not harass um, or make any decisions based on gender, race, things like that. That must be in your personnel manual. But if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm, I'm being harassed, what you need to sit them down and, and say first, write it out. I want you to tell me your, your narrative. Give me your story. And then as you're making a decision on what to do, you need to look at it and say, okay, 
is this just a little bit of workplace banter that happened on one time, or is this something that's happening every day uh, without end? I had a case on the coast one time uh, where uh, a man that was disabled um, was being harassed, being made fun of by his coworkers. He was a road crew guy. Um, these guys, a lot of times, are you know they're hardworking, blue collar guys, and they mess with each other just like seventh graders. And uh, they were they were riding this guy, you know, and it hurt his feelings. Um, and it it ended up looking like pretty hostile because it was every day, um, every minute they were worrying him, messing with him. He had PTSD from serving in um, Iraq, and he he would get really upset with loud noises and every other day you know they would get a truck close enough to him that was a two or three feet away and they'd pull a, a diesel horn on him you know and startle the heck out of him um, what you're going to need to look at when these things are reported as you're deciding to take action is the frequency and the severity anytime there's physical threats though um, that's when you need to really say okay we gotta we gotta take some action um, when there's physical threats, you need to call that other, the threatening party in. It needs to be written up. They need to know that can't happen. And I wouldn't let more than one of those go by. You know, if that happens once, the next time there's a physical threat to anybody by that same person, they need to hit the door. Because you're on notice, right? A lot of the law when it comes to employment practices is, did the employer know or should they have known that this was going on? If so, the court is going to be very strict on you. If you knew or should have known that this harassment was going on, there's a problem there. I, I love to get ahead of my slides there, as you can see. Um, as, as I mentioned, it is super important that you have a method set out in your policies by which an employee can complain about an issue. Think this through, folks. If I have in my policy that uh, a jailer is to report harassment to their supervisor who will then uh, take it to the sheriff, what if that supervisor is the person who's doing the harassing, right? So what I always put in the policy manuals that I draft is, because we usually like them to report to that supervisor, or in the event that supervisor is the alleged um, harassing party, the chief deputy, or the sheriff, whoever. You need to have, you need to have a fallback. Make sense? It's just, it's just simple. But you need to have it specified in your policies and you need to follow it. When somebody comes to you and says, look, I want to I, I want to complain about a guy harassing me, you need to jerk that policy out real quick and look at it and say, okay, uh, we, we have to have you fill out this sheet. Follow that policy. If you disregard the policy, it's no longer valid. Let me paint you a picture of what I see a perfect ADA claim is first. And then we'll talk about a little bit of the legal specifics. Picture uh, a lady with just a GED and she takes a job at a convenience store. And, you know, typical convenience store, gas and beer and cigarettes. She works her way up, and within a couple of months, she's the assistant manager and making the deposits. Within six months, she's managing the store. Within a year, she's managing three stores. Roll forward 10 years down the line, she's managing seven stores. She starts to have some medical issues. She thinks it's the stress of a really tough job. She's letting her, her employer know by text that she's going to see a doctor. Uh, she's even hospitalized one time for some tightening in her chest. Uh, this goes on for a period of time and she's, she's letting her employer know. Uh, she's doing her job, she's uh, salaried and so she's not having to clock in or clock out, but she stays in pretty good touch with her supervisor because she's driving a company car and she's going from store to store. She's working long hours. She's not feeling good, she's exhausted. She lets him know that they found a spot on her lungs and, and that they're monitoring that. She comes in one day and gets news on some tests. She tells a co-employee privately 
she then goes and sets up an appointment with her boss, drives to where all of the stores are managed. She goes in and says, I, I've, I've been told that I've got lung cancer. Uh, they've been monitoring it and they're gonna have to do surgery. They're gonna have to remove part of my lungs, but they say it's, it's very curable. I will be out for a period of time. Uh, I'll be happy to get all that taken care of, but they say I should be fully recovered. The employer looks at her and says, well, we're very sorry, uh, but we're gonna be eliminating your position anyway. Turn in your keys and clean out your car. Can we drop you off? That's an ADA claim, folks. Uh, now, the way that claim worked, and I don't do many on the plaintiff side, uh, the way that claim worked, or that employer hired a bunch of very sophisticated attorneys. I get the personnel file because it's all sent into the EEOC. She's required, if she wants to make a charge uh, of disability discrimination, as I call it, she's required to go and file a charge within 180 days with the EEOC. They want to verify whether or not she had a tangible employment action that she's challenging. Well, yeah, she got fired. They want to verify, is she a protected person under the statute? Well, yeah, she had cancer. Uh, the statute, as we'll talk about, provides for both actual disability and an employer taking action on the basis of perceived disability. Now, what you see in garden variety, free world, non-governmental entity litigation that deals with these exact same things that we come in to defend you on, time and time again, is they will put some hotshot associate on it and they will dig up every bad thing about a person possible. Uh, they will do what I call paper the file. In other words, this lady was supervising a bunch of stores. She was running the roads miles and miles a week. Those stores are inspected both by the entities that have franchises uh, and uh, some of the vendors. There are inspections that are performed on a spot basis by companies that are independently contracted to come in. That's a good yardstick of how she was doing her job. Well, when the employer is busy papering her file to justify getting rid of the lady with cancer, they send in inspection reports showing, look, she had one of her stores check out with an 86. Now, an 86 doesn't sound that bad, especially my math grades in high school, I'd have been happy for an 86. Okay, that, that's not my skill. Uh, actually, my spelling and grammar, but I, but I told him early on that I was gonna have a secretary to do that. And I, I, my seventh grade teacher still nods her head and acknowledges that I told her that and I was right. Uh, but in this lady's file, when I come back and pick through what they've provided to the EEOC, I see this papering and I say, 86 is, is well, that's, that's, not, that's not great, but she said, well, they didn't send in all my other scores. They do inspections once a week. This entity here does inspections once a quarter. Well, do you have any of those? Because the employer was refusing to produce them. Oh yeah, I kept my emails. I've got email after email after email, 99s, 98s, 100s. I've got her employer, the one that sent in the 86, emailing everybody else in the company, look at what a good job she did. You're raising the scores for the whole company. Yet they send in this garbage to try to make her look bad, to try to justify their employment decision. I hope you're taking that in and understand don't do that because we'll have to write somebody a check. Now, what happens in these cases 
is that you run it through and there's this evaluation process by the EEOC and they're going to ask for all types of information. They're going to ask for a position statement. Now whether outside counsel does it or one of us or another attorney, it needs to run by your attorney and you need to keep in mind how this is going to look to the rest of the world because it's not right to unfairly represent somebody's performance. You don't want it done to you and you don't want to be guilty of doing it to somebody else. It makes you look bad and we don't want to look bad. Uh, you know, instead of saying this is our business justification for doing this, which is pretty much indefensible, uh, they tried to make her look bad. Then they tried to make litigation difficult and expensive. Well, let me explain to you why none of that works. Uh, because paper, emails, personnel files, what you send to the EEOC as part of the response process, whether I'm showing up down the line or I'm assisting in it getting sent in, you've made the record we got. So. That's why that's the first thing I'm going to ask for. And I'm going to want to see if it's an employee that's controlled by board minutes. I'm going to want to see what the board minutes are. I'm going to want to see what their personnel file is. I'm going to want to see what exactly the disciplinary issues or the complaints have been over the years. Because there is a bit of a, with these type of claims, uh, and I'm using ADA as, as a backdrop, there's a bit of a, a back and forth uh, because there are anti-retaliation provisions. And uh, when we get into litigation, and these cases sometimes go to litigation, after the EEOC has evaluated the file, they're going to do one of a couple things. They're going to have input back from the individual making a claim, and they're going to say, well, Ma'am, the employer sent all this on you and they said your, your stores were just kind of checking out kind of average and weren't making money. Uh, they said that you were having these problems with people driving off from the pumps at your stores and not doing anything about it. Uh, they said that you were cited for this and that and the other. That employee then tells the EEOC representative if they're on top of things, well, ask for this and ask for this and ask for that. So the EOC comes back and they ask for additional documentation. It's not necessarily a red flag if they come back and ask you for more documentation, but you need to tighten up a little bit. <laughs> um, by now, you've already run it by your board attorney and you've tried to be as complete as possible. Uh, and you've made a record that's really hard to backtrack off of. Uh, so if the EOC wants to pursue it themselves, they will join and get involved. Or they will simply, if somebody is represented by an attorney in, in that sort of situation, if I were the plaintiff's attorney, and I've done some of that, I'd send them a letter and say, I'm representing Jane Doe. Uh, I would like you to go ahead and issue us a right to sue. Because until the EEOC issues a right to sue, we can't do anything on behalf of a plaintiff. Now, once the EEOC issues that right to sue, they've got 90 days to take action. But when it gets in litigation, if it's really been done right on the employer's side, on the front end, I've got all the documentation I ought to have. Because if it isn't there, in there already, then we've got to answer the questions, well, why didn't y'all give that to the EEOC? It's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's always inferences to be drawn from what we say and from what we don't say. So I know I'm trying not to, well, I'm trying to talk to you and not preach, but be really aware of that process. And now in the, uh, if I have a clicker, in the context of the ADA, it impacts tangible employment decisions. Now, lawyers can dig through all kinds of Supreme Court positions on what a tangible employment decision is. The U.S. Supreme Court has weighed in. All of the various circuit courts have weighed in. But 
you look at decisions as impacting all of these factors, recruiting, hiring, firing, training, job assignments, benefits, layoffs, leads, it's pretty broad. In a nutshell, a county or a sheriff's department uh, or any other county department uh, can't discriminate against a disabled citizen uh, so long as they're able to perform the essential functions of their job and they're qualified. Um, there are two ways to do that. Uh, either you have a physical or mental, mental impairment that substantially li limits your job functions and life activity or the employer perceives you as disabled. Well, anything that requires perception is arguable. And if I'm a plaintiff's attorney, I'm not only gonna sue, I was disabled and treated differently because of my disability, I'm gonna sue and say, you perceived me as disabled. Because it gets into a little bit more of a room for a factual argument. If I'm on the plaintiff's side, I'm gonna want to argue facts because I get to a jury. And juries don't like people with cancer getting fired. So, we've got an example up here on the slides. An alcoholic has a form of disability. That does not mean you can drink on the job. But now, if you are in treatment, uh, it, they, it, it's not a factor. Uh, you know, I, I've got a pending claim right now. I guess I need to be careful about talking about pending claims. But I've got a pending claim right now that involves alcohol in the workplace. Now, it's not a disability if he drank a pint of some kind of rye before he showed up to drive the county truck. <laughs> you've got a right, <laughs> you've got a right I, I, to prohibit that. Uh, the same thing with drugs. Uh, you can't do drugs on the job. It is an unreasonable exposure, yet, if somebody is in recovery, uh, that's not a factor. That's not a factor you can hold against them. Uh, now, what types of accommodations does an employer have to make? Uh, those are typically the type of discussions that I get into if I am being school board attorney or city attorney or advising a county board, and they're fairly specific to the factual situation, realize that you have to have reasonable accommodations or you're entitled to reasonable accommodation. Um, but now, if you can't do the job, you cannot do the job, period. Uh, we can do fancy lawyer words to it, but if you cannot do the job without reasonable accommodations, then you just can't. Now, I've seen sheriff's departments take uh, road deputies who no longer could perform on the road, sometimes maybe because of the loss of a limb or, or, or because of severe complications of diabetes, and change their position to a dispatcher position or change their position to a desk position. I mean, those are reasonable accommodations. They have. Uh, the, you know, the intent behind this from Congress is that our disabled citizens are still meaningful to our, you know, the, the, the mission of getting the job done for the individual department uh, can still be served by accommodating, uh, you know, the, the experience and ability of people that are limited. You just, you just have to, you just have to make accommodations. So. Uh, before I get too much into age, which is short and simple, whether it's age, disability, gender, race, religion, this same framework that I described for you of needing to make a charge with the EEOC, needing to go through that charging process, needing to file suit within 90 days of a right to sue. Those are all things the plaintiff has got to do. On the defense side, same thing. 
You need to respond. And documenting the file on the day you get the charge in from the EEOC because Danny claims whatever, it ought to already be documented. You already, already have performance evaluations. If there's been a termination, it already ought to be on your minutes. Uh, if there's an appeal process, then it should have either been exercised by the employee and documented, or the employee knowingly didn't exercise it. Uh, you ought to be done. And it's a matter of copying the paperwork, thinking about your answer, articulating the position that you're going to have to live with and sending it to the EEOC. Now, that's a perfect world. Uh, but uh, that's our job to tell you best circumstances, what we would like to see. That's what I want to see is, is a, is a well-developed policy. I want to see uh, people having an opportunity to state grievances, people having an opportunity to appeal unfair employment decisions. Because if everything works, it's not going to end up in a federal court. It's going to there's a certain amount of autonomy that we have as a governmental entity if we do it right. Now, that means that the suits that we ought to get ought to be pretty much frivolous. Age Deployment, Age Employment Discrimination Act. Believe it or not, these young folks below 40, Will, are you protected? You're protected status now. Uh, at 40, you have protected status. Person and we both applied for a position, and the younger person got the position, and age was a factor, age was a motivating factor, then that is illegal. Now, if you give it to the older guy because of age, it's not illegal, it only protects, <laughs> and it protects those of us who are over 40. Um, it's just the way it is. Uh, but the same framework would apply. Uh, and you can get a whole lot more detail on age discrimination from, from Googling it. My job is to give you practical, practical advice. And that is quite simply, you cannot have uh, someone's age, if they are 40 or over, be a substantial factor in an employment decision. Uh, now, you don't have to hire them if they're too young for the job. You know, uh, you can hire the 43-year-old over the 22-year-old all day long. Uh, but uh, that's, that, that's, that's the big picture. I see that come up, the ADEA, mostly in my sheriff's departments. When we have a, a deputy who's been with us a long time, is over the protected age and physically starts to deteriorate, um, you know, that's where we see that come up most often because you got a 25 year old who still doesn't know what it means to creak and crack when you get up in the morning. Um, but it's coming for them, I guarantee you. Family Medical Leave Act. Who's had any experience with this? Raise your hand. I figured you did, Mr. Griffith. This is one of those that you just, um, so many people, including our employees, just don't know a lot about it. Um, the Family Medical Leave Act came about in 1993, um, and it was to provide for leave under certain family or medical circumstances. It had a lot to do with the changing face of the modern family. Um, uh, that, that's primarily why it came to be. Um, the significant benefits are 12, leave, 12 weeks of, of leave per year. Um, what we call job maintenance or, or job protection. You, you, know, you leave your job and that, that position or one very similar to it is held for you. And then you, you have your health benefits during that time. One of the, the big things that so many people don't understand is it is unpaid leave. Um, I regularly have people call my office saying, well, I didn't get my, my 12 weeks of paid leave. And I say, well, does your policy manual say you're entitled to paid leave for something? Well, no, I'm talking about the FMLA. No, no, it's unpaid leave. Um, and I may have a slide on this, I don't remember. One of the things that, that can happen, though, is uh, if you're the employee, you could take 
your, uh, your time off, your, your PTO, and, and get paid. You can take your, your vacation that's accrued and your, your time off and, and get paid. And, and as an employer, you can require that even, that they take any uh, paid leave they have before FMLA kicks in. Keep that in mind. They would not run contemporaneously. The, the paid leave would occur and then you kick in FMLA benefits. If you're going to require that, it needs to be in your policy manual. Um, there are a few restrictions. You know, in the private world, there's some, some uh, population restrictions in terms of how many employees you have, which, which basically they exempted small employers. There are no such uh, restrictions for a governmental entity. It, FMLA applies if, you, if you're a governmental entity. Uh, the employer, uh, the employee, however, um, has to have been working for you for a year. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, a consecutive 1,250 hours that they've worked within 12 months, though. So they could have come to work for you, as, as it says here in the example, uh, two years ago, worked 1,200 hours, and that counts towards FMLE leave when he is rehired. This means your record keeping has to be good, right? Because if you hadn't kept up with that, and the employee has, then you can have a problem when he asks for that leave. All right, this, this question is kind of a no-brainer, but what is the most common federal lit civil litigation? No hint. Thank you, Sheriff. <laughs> it, it, is, it is an extremely difficult area. And we'll mention this as a helicopter ride. This is really a helicopter ride. You have to be so careful. Uh, I'm going to cover some basics, some very basics. But be very careful with wage and hour. Fair Labor Standards Act establishes standards for minimum wage, overtime, record keeping requirements, and employment of youth workers. Uh, it applies to you, uh, period. There are some exempt employees, and like I said, this is a helicopter ride. The exemptions are both statutory and interpreted by regulations and opinions that are quite detailed. I'm going to give you some big picture examples, okay? If you, most of the exemptions, when you look at them as big picture examples, are kind of common sense. Uh, different types of key person, managerial, administrative employees. Uh, example, um, a police chief is typically exempt. Uh, higher level administration is typically exempt. And there's some exemptions that, are, that don't concern us, uh, farm work. But what does concern us are firefighters, EMTs, law enforcement. And there are specific regulations for each of those. Uh, there are specific considerations that you have to take into account defining whether they are applicable. So like I said again, this is big picture. Uh, but firefighters would include those trained in fire protection. Uh, you know, those are the people that obviously are the people who are going to respond to the fire. Um, the uh, same situation with law enforcement. Now, the difficulty of Fair Labor Standards Act is magnified or at least easier to complain about uh, when you take into context. Sometimes our definitions of law enforcement what is and what is not law enforcement, say, for the Mississippi Tort Claims Act, for a state law claim, or uh, what is or what is not uh, the type of policymaking structure that we would have within a law enforcement agency. If we're looking at a federal 1983 claim, and then you've got Fair Labor Standards Act, and it's going to be different. Uh, there are subtle nuances and differences in all of these, but the basics are that 
law enforcement and firefighters are covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. And what it does, in addition to uh, the normal 40 hour week from which you would pay overtime, uh, it averages out an additional three hours per week. And it depends on the pay period that the employer elects. It uh, depends significantly on how you are structured, 12 hour shifts, eight hour shifts, whether the employee has the type of position such as your investigators and your detectives that don't do most of their job up at the sheriff's department, they're out and about. Uh, how are you keeping up with their comp time? Uh, in a perfect world, clock, time clocks. Uh, when I have to deal, when I have had to deal with law enforcement claims and they don't have time clocks, I, it's difficult. Yeah. It's difficult. I mean, it's it. The employer has the burden, not the employee. In every other facet that I can think of in civil litigation, we talk about burdens. Typically, a plaintiff, the person suing, uh, either by themselves or with an attorney asking for some type of relief, they have a certain degree of a burden. If you're dealing with this type of litigation, which is probably why it's so popular, there are damage provisions, there are attorney fee recovery positions, provisions, and the employer has the burden of proof on most everything. Um, so, uh, the things that I've seen that I felt were very difficult to defend. Uh, sheriff's departments, time records, well, let's go to the radio log. That's all we've got. I, I can tell you how that works out. It, it, it's a miserable experience. It's a miserable experience for the lawyer <laughs> that's trying to defend it. It's a miserable experience for experts that we bring in to try to calculate the time. Uh, if you're in a situation where you've got to go back and you've got to spend six weeks to tell me how much overtime somebody had and documented, we got a problem. Uh, so, I, like I said, with this wage an hour helicopter ride, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the bad things. Uh, and and that, is, that is one of those deputies clocking in and out. You know, you have to go 10-7, 10-8 over the radio. But what do you do with investigators that are on some type of assignment that's known to the sheriff but not clocked in over the radio log because they're investigating something because you don't want it going out over the scanner? You've built in a situation to where you don't have record keeping. And when you don't have record keeping and it's your burden, it's obviously a problem. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is a very difficult area, like I said. Uh, recommendations are to do not have clock in and clock out over radio logs. Uh, there are some software applications being developed that would let people clock in and clock out using cell phones. Uh, I've not seen one that worked. Uh, I'm sure they are out there. Um, I'm sure a time clock is burdensome. But like I said, if you want to be fully protected, you're going to have to have records. Uh, now, if you have employees that are cheating on overtime, what do you do? you write them up and you discipline them. Because if you don't do anything about it and the wage and hour claim comes up, it's gonna fall back on you. Uh, that means your human resources department is going to have to be up to speed on what's going on. Um, if it's possible, let's say that um, the most recent one I looked at was with a North Mississippi County and it came to their attention that they had uh, some issues where they, they'd been missing some hours, the, the, the way they were paying. They should have paid a small amount of overtime in some instances, and they weren't doing it. What they did was 
instead of letting a bunch of plaintiff's lawyers come in and rake through everything they had, they involved the U.S. Department of Labor, they brought them in, they cooperated, they learned where they needed to tighten things up, and yeah, they paid what they owed. Uh, the alternative, the, the, the litigation expense for you to defend it, and 99% of the time there's no insurance coverage that's going to pick that up for you. Uh, and then the litigation expense that you're going to have because the other attorneys on the other side are probably going to get upwards of between $250 and $300 an hour from the federal judge that has the case for making you do what the law says you have to do. That's just not, a, that's just not an option. We don't budget for that with our governmental entities. We don't budget for those type of $100,000, $200,000 bumps. They're going to come out of some budget, somebody's budget. So the best thing you can do is to be policied up and be very, very prepared. Document retention. Uh, a normal Fair Labor Standards Act violation, if it's not deemed to be willful, uh, they go back two years. It's best to keep your documents three years at a minimum of three years, I would say three and a half, uh, because they can, if it goes into litigation, the judge is going to let them demand your records for three years, and so you better have them. Um, the minimums of what you should have uh, is employee records, and, and you all have this. Uh, name, address, birth date, work schedule, earnings, pay schedule. You've got to be able to document to the satisfaction of an outside federal agency that you're paying people right. Again, those three years payroll records, uh, collective bargaining agreements are not really something that you're going to have, but if you had a situation where the Department of Labor has been in and investigated you before, they're going to they're want to look at the results of that investigation. Um, and if it's one of those to where you have that situation, uh, common sense says live and learn, cooperate, and I don't mean cooperate to the point of being ridiculous, but you have, you, you've got a duty to cooperate. Cooperate and learn from the experience because there's just not, there's just not a good way to go through these. Uh, we, had, we had a rash of this pop up some years ago with the schools. Uh, a Supreme Court decision came out and they interpreted our school un uncertified staff as applicable uh, entitled to overtime. Well, we had people, for instance, with the little school district I represented, we had, we had uh, staff that came in to clean up every afternoon. They didn't work 20, 25 hours a week, but we weren't having them time clock in and out. Nobody was. None of the school districts were. They were easy pickings. They were easy pickings in terms of record keeping violations. They were easy pickings in terms of the school districts not being able to meet their burden to show that they were acting in compliance with the law. Um, now, what happens if you have a record keeping violation? The plaintiff is not going to get damages just because your records are bad but their attorneys is going to get attorney's fees. And if the uh, Department of Labor comes in, they can find you, well, you see it, up to $1,100 per violation, and that's probably changed since I did this slide. So that's a short, short overview of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, but you've got to be prepared for it. Uh, it is, it is it is not entirely avoidable. A lot of our litigation is like that. It is not entirely avoidable, but you can be prepared. And if you have a situation where you have small violations, it is best to deal with them and do whatever corrective measures that you have to take to get into compliance uh, because you do not want to go through protracted litigation because you're going to pay your attorneys, you're going to pay your experts, your human resource staff and your payroll department is going to be dealing with digging through old records instead of doing this month's work. 
Uh, and like I said, you're going to be paying your attorneys and you're going to be paying their attorneys. It's best just to pay people right. The Mississippi Open Records Act, has anybody had any experience with this yet? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is no small deal and um, you really need to be familiar with it. The basic principle behind the Open Records Act uh, is that public records be available for inspection by citizens. All public records. Um, why do this? Well, I, it's pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, for, for tax purposes, for transparency in terms of corruption, and, and just for overall accountability, um, the government wants citizens to be able to look at the government's records. You know, if, if, if a citizen thinks the Sheriff's Department is whooping too many people, they ought to be able to look at their instant reports and see. Um, here's the, the key of this entire little presentation. Except as otherwise provided, all public records are hereby declared public property. So here's the deal. The default on any record you have is this is a public record. To, to not be a public record, we have to squeeze it into a small exemption. And I say squeeze because there are very, very few exemptions. Um, the actual statute gives people the right to inspect, to copy, to mechanically reproduce or obtain a reproduction of any public record of any public body in accordance with reasonable written procedures. Keep that in mind because that's going to come back. I'm going to talk about that again. Uh, what does this mean simply? We have to begin with the underlying principle that everything you generate is going to be available for public consumption. Think about that. Everything. Um, that means you need to be careful what you say in writing. Doesn't it? What, I, I, what about text messages on a cell phone paid for by the county? There you go. Emails Te coming from the county administrator. Public record. Emails from the coming from the county administrator that copy the board attorney. <coughs> Maybe not. There's an exemption that's not in the statute. An email or a text message to your board attorney very likely will be privileged by the attorney-client privilege if you're seeking legal advice. Not if you're asking where to eat in New Orleans. Um, we need to be careful and really I, I, when I'm talking about this I'm talking about my, my officers. We need to be careful what we write down. You know, um, last thing you want to do is put something in there that will be um, not really relevant to the the incident and could be used against us. Well, does it apply to you? Absolutely. It applies to every public body, every department, bureau, division, including um, your sheriff's department, um, your tax assessor's office, your chancery clerk, every one of them uh, are subject to the Public Records Act. There's nothing, there's no subdivision that is uh, off limits. And I just throw this in to always show what, what is a public record? Everything. <laughs> I mean, it's everything, including uh, audio and video. All right? Um, there's even a catch all in the statute after listing this, which it specifically lists those things. After that, there's a catch-all that says any other documentary, materi documentary materials, regardless of physical form of characteristics, insert everything. Everything, everything. Um, one thing that's, that's important, I, and I wanted to talk about Sheriff's Department records because there's a, there's a big black hole here that we need to discuss. Um, Sheriff's Department records, all of these things, Arrest reports, offense reports, accident reports, dispatch log, right? The offense report, some of, there's a difference between, an, uh, it depends on what your language is. There's an investigative report, and then there's an instant report. 
All right, an investigative report has information in it other than just the basics of an incident. If we go out and we work uh, a burglary in the county and we throw down the name of the Vic and a few other things, that's an incident report. But now, if one of our detectives says, so-and-so lives next door and said they saw a red car pulling out yesterday, it's such a, that's an investigative report. If it includes our thoughts on leads and analysis, investigation, that's an investigative report and it, it is exempt. It does not have to be turned over. A regular old incident report, though, does. So if we work a wreck in the county, that, that's an incident report. It, it's got to be turned over. Your, your, your dispatch logs, public record, I produce them in every case I'm involved in now. I, because they're typically, they are the only thing that we can set a, a, a reasonable, objective timeline. We are often having to produce those tapes, the audio tapes. A lot of my folks still have a system that, that after 30 days they can't get that audio. I hate those. I like the systems where it's there in perpetuity. We got it all. Some more of these wonderful things that are all public records at your sheriff's department. You see all these, the jail docket, the meal log, all of that stuff is a public record available for consumption by the public. Now, let me, before I move on, what I see is the coming storm in this area, and this is a very uh, ripe area right now. Uh, there's some lawyers in Mississippi that love the Public Records Act. Um, one of our good friends up here in Tupelo, that's a plaintiff's lawyer whom you probably all know, uh, he's sending out public records requests before he files suits every time now. He's getting public information before he files a case. Um, I see a problem coming with our body cameras. Um, depends on how you're going to hold uh, that information. Right now, as far as I'm aware, I was asked to come to the subcommittee meeting at the Department of uh, Mississippi Department of History and Archives. They set record retention schedules. So you got to hold on to, you know, jail, law, um, jail logs for such and such years. I was asked to come to the one on the uh, body cameras. It did not go forward. Uh, as far as I know, they've not set the retention record uh, time on a body camera video yet. Um, that's good and bad. The good is we don't, you know, we, they're not telling us we got to keep it for the next 20 years. Uh, the bad is how, how much are we supposed to hold on to? Um, my only concern, I love body cameras, by the way. I, I, you know, I think that's a great tool for us to use to limit our liability. But what if somebody sends us a public records request that says, I want all body camera video from every um, drug arrest for the past five years. If you've got a system where the video stays in your system um, for ever, you're going to have to stick somebody over there to respond to it. There is no objection that, hey, this is too hard. This is too difficult for us. There's no objection. We can charge them a reasonable fee. But that's a, that's a concern, I think, that we ha I haven't got an answer yet. Uh, it's something we've been talking about at the Sheriff's Conference, trying to figure out that issue. But keep that in mind on your body cameras, that that is a public record. And you cannot refuse it unless to allow it at that moment would interfere with the investigation or prosecution or reveal sources. Then you could hold it back temporarily. But, I mean, if it's something that happened three months ago and it's not under investigation, as far as we're concerned, it wasn't a big deal, we got to turn everything over. Now, the, the, the key to me on a public records uh, it's issue is you got to have a written policy. You, you, you know, you just got to have one. If you don't have a written policy on how you're to respond to public records, you get one day. And you guys know as well as I do, we got other things to do than respond to public records requests. One day is, is not going to be sufficient time. Um, if you have a written policy, you can set it as far as seven days. It used to be 14. They cut it back two years ago to seven. So the max amount of time you can give yourself is seven days. 
But if you don't have a written policy, it's one, one working day. The penalty here is not go to jail. It's not horrific, but it's a $100 fine for each incident that's a violation of you failing to produce. Uh, they can see you in Chancery Court. They don't have to go through an administrative agency. They can go straight to Chancery Court, sue you, and they can get not only the $100, but they can get reasonable attorney's fees and expenses that they incurred in trying to get the document. Seven days, there you, there's your slide there. Now you can charge a fee for your having to produce records. What we oftentimes do is um, we see who it would take to, to, to find these records and we, because it's a public policy and it's good for uh, Mississippi, we find the lowest paid employee that is capable of obtaining those records and then we'll get them to, to clock their time and we'll charge them that hourly rate. So if it takes them, you know, three hours and, and they're making 15 bucks an hour, then we're going to pay them 40, charge them $45. And the copy cost, you know, I mean, especially if we get in here and they're asking for, um, if it's some sort of issue on a, uh, a building and, and we've got codes and un or unincorporated portions of the county and they want, you know, blueprints that are abnormal size, and we got to send them out, we got to recover our cost. Um, you cannot do what the hospitals did 10 years ago and start charging, you know, $10 per page. You know, the legislature came in and, and fixed that and gave them a cap because they were being ridiculous. So if you produce five documents, don't come up with a, you know, a $300 fee unless the, your, your person had to look through reams and reams of paper to, 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 to uncover those documents. Um, I think it's a safe basis to say, though, you get your lowest paid employee, charge them the hourly rate that it takes to do it. That's, that's a reasonable fee. I don't see how that can be attacked. If you can't produce the record within seven days, and, and look, everything I'm saying has got to go through your board attorney. Um, nothing drives me crazier than when my sheriff can't get a hold of me the first day he tries to catch me on one of these and he decides to respond without talking to me. You need to talk to your board attorney every time a records request comes in, fax it over there and let he or she help you make this happen. But if you can't produce them within the, the seven day time period or whatever time you specify in your policy, you have to provide a written explanation to the person requesting the record. Then you have to tell them, hey, this is why I can't, but this is when I can do it. Unless mutually agreed on, under no circumstances can it be produced later than 14 days out of the, after the receipt of the original request. Unless you can get the other side to agree, that is the total max you got, two weeks, okay? Um, if you do decide that, hey, production of this document would um, reveal a source that we don't want revealed yet, or would obstruct our ability to fully investigate this case, you have to send a, 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 a note to the requesting party explaining why you're withholding it. Let me give you a, 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 fi a fine example. I've got a, a case in South Mississippi where we picked up a guy on a DUI. A uh, guy's daddy comes to pick him up. He walks in the SO carrying a drink. He has clearly had more than that drink that day because he's very happy uh, in the sense that he's uh, happy in his own head. He's very unhappy that his young son has been arrested for DUI because he's a prominent fella. He, uh, in South Mississippi, we say he, he, he took to acting a fool. And we got video of it because he did it in the dadgum lobby of the Sheriff's Department. Raised cane. Um, we, we eventually had to arrest him. We, we told him to calm down. We told him to you know walk away, that kind of thing. He just wouldn't listen. Nothing would do, but we put him on the ground and arrested him. Um, I have since gotten a public records request for the video of that incident. 
from a very prominent plaintiff's lawyer. And as far as I was, the, the prosecution is still ongoing on him. As far as I was concerned, we had no legitimate reason within the sheriff's department to withhold the video. But I had to call the prosecutor and say, hey, I've got a records request. I'm going to turn this over unless you tell me that this will impede your investigation and prosecution. He called me back Monday and I hadn't gotten back with him because I've been on the road. But that's the kind of thing that, that occurs if you really um, you know, if you feel like this is going to impede your investigation, you need to be, art be able to articulate a reason why, and then you're going to have to give them uh, that in writing. So it needs to be something you can really stand on is what I'm saying to you. You also have to maintain a file of denials for at least three years, and the reason for this is obvious. They want to see if you've got a pattern of just denying folks' records, because that goes against the public policy, right? I mean, I'll tell you what, if it was up to my sheriffs, they'd deny every request. I mean, you know, don't get in our business. I had a, one of my good friends who's a sheriff in uh, East Mississippi. Um, board attorney sent me a records request, said, what do you think? I looked it over. Um, it involved the death of some citizens, but they were engaged in crime at the time of their death, but they're dead. We ain't prosecuting them. We can't say that it would impede a prosecution of three dead souls. So I sent him back a note and said, hey, produce it. Man, I mean, that thing hadn't come off the email to him. Within six minutes, I had a voicemail from the sheriff. I don't want to produce that. And I called him back, and there's no reason not to. He just didn't like the idea of it. As I said, um, noncompliance, they can seek equitable relief, which is, hey, produce it. And then they can also uh, ask for the $100 plus, in all caps, because it's expensive. All reasonable expenses incurred in bringing uh, the proceeding. There's some, some letters missing there. Um, they got to hire an attorney to go file this thing. They're going to they're gonna get you for attorney's fees. Other than Danny and I, attorneys aren't cheap. So every document is public. The exceptions to that are extremely limited. A timely response is required. If you're going to uh, not make it timely, you've got to provide a written excuse. Why? You've got 14 days total time if you, if you ask for that. Um, if you can't produce in seven, you, you could get 14 at most. Um, and uh, you, have to, you have to give them a, you know absolute written detail explanation and when you're going to produce it. The long and the short of it is handle these things and get them done. Public's entitled to the records. If you have a problem every time something comes up with production, you got a bigger problem than the Open Records Act. What questions do you have? What about personnel records? Are those public? That's a great question. Personnel records are um, one of the things <coughs> that, that there have been uh, Exemption zone. Let me uh, give you a couple more. You're going to have to tell them what the county administrator makes, but you can't give them the county administrator's so social security number and date of birth. There you go. I mean, they're, they're, it takes time with personnel records because there's redaction necessarily involved. And you understand that is a super important point. If you have part of a record that is not, that should be exempt, but part of it isn't, you got to produce it with the uh, redactions. So um, some academic records can be exempt. Y'all wouldn't care about that. Uh, appraisal records, um, attorney work product, hospital records. Now they can ask for, if it's a county run hospital, they can ask for financials, but they can't ask for actual medical records. Um, jury records notes that the jury takes in making a decision back there. Lawyers always want to see what jurors are thinking. Those things are exempt. Personnel files, uh, section 25-1-100, um, says that personnel records and applications for employment shall be exempt. 
letters of recommendation. I mean, he, here's one of those acts that um, I was looking at the statute. There's so many things in there, you have to actually look. Um, but you can find a lot. Uh, section, uh, it starts at 25-1-61. Um, I could tell you that. And the folks down at the Eth Ethics Commission are really helpful. That, that, they'll yeah. return your call and answer most everything. That's right. Yeah, 25-61-1 is the start of the Public Records Act. Um, it defines what a public record is and then you'll find in there at the bottom of the statute notes and notes and notes on decisions uh, as well as ref cross-references to some other exemptions. Unfortunately for us, not every exemption is specified in the act itself. They, they cross-reference to other places um, where there are some exemptions.